Welcome back, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Hill from Vox Markets, and I'm delighted this morning to have Justin Urquhart Stewart with me, um, expert in all things capital markets related, and founder of Seven Investment Manager. Morning, Justin. Good morning, Paul. Good to see you. Now, the sort of burning question before we get into the sort of the macro stuff is, uh, what is the uh, the rationale behind the uh, the red braces? <laughs> <laughs> well, the prime rationale is to keep the trousers up. Um, but actually, most of them came from my, my father. And of course, it was, I originally started off as the world's most useless lawyer. Um, and uh, as a lawyer, you traditionally used to have sort of red braces and things like that. If you're standing there with your wig and your braces under your gown. And uh, frankly, it just carried on from there. After all, button to your trousers. So unless you're actually going to start changing all your trousers again, you're sort of stuck with them, really. But um, <laughs> after that, they always became a sort of brand. So. Let's carry on. Okay. Well, um, moving now to sort of the big picture sort of stuff. We've had oh. a really strong equity rally since the March 23rd oh. lows. And you could certainly argue that some of the valuations on NASDAQ at 30 times earnings on average are looking rather stretched. And even I think it was like Tesla's on about sort of eight, 38 times sales. So it's looking yeah. pretty pricey at certain places. Is this rally sustainable? Are we in sort of a cloud cuckoo land? Well, I have to say, when you get sort of uh, Mr. Trump starting to quote Nasdaq and saying that's his great success, I have to say that gives you a certain level of concern. First of all, I thought I think it's absolutely crucial the basic rules of investing. I remember this time last year, you know, saying when you're preparing for more volatility coming through. And remember, before the, the we had the virus, we were all aware that the economy was going to go through a change. We're probably heading for a significant slowdown, potentially even a recession. So how are we going to manage that? And the whole one of the key things was to make sure you had enough cash on the side to take advantage of it. Now, OK, none of us knew that uh, the virus was coming. But nonetheless, had you obeyed your old fashioned rules of going into volatility, you'd been well prepared to take advantage of it. And so I have to find it's been an extremely good year for investors this year if you'd followed your disciplines. So we've seen a great recovery, but a lot of that recovery is not operating according to normal investment behavior because normally you'd expect the market to be discounting 18 months ahead that would be the idea but of course it can't it doesn't can't see through it so it's reacting to political issues it's reacting to virus news as to whether they actually found a you know some form of the right form of injection for us all and so it's almost day to day and of course the packages that the governments have been coming out with to try and provide short-term support so those what, are what you, short term Justin, issues. You, Justin, what do you think is the sort of the short term turning potential turning point to the market, whether positive or negative? Is that going to be sort of like a, you know a medical solution? Is it going to be sort of the presidential election, or is it really going to be sort of like you know other things like Europe not doing enough stimulus measures? Well, there are a whole combination of issues as ever, aren't there? And all of them will have a certain level of effect. What would be seen as a good election in America would be, well, is it a change for Trump? Well, bear in mind, the Democrats aren't always seen as necessarily very good for the markets. But nonetheless, it would probably give a level of stability to the concern that the lack of political leadership you've got in America at the moment. So that would be one thing to look for. Obviously, if you've got a viral cure of some kind, that would be a big tick in and certainly again, give people more confidence that you could see some return of stability coming through. Do you but think we'll also get now got to... Justin, do you think we'll get through oh, the we'll... second wave? Oh, I think we will get through. It's, now, I don't know that they, if you look back to 1917-18, the second wave was disastrous. Mm. What would appear to be in this case is that the second waves we're seeing is affecting, has affected the, you know, the older, the weaker, doesn't seem to be affecting the younger. The mortality rate's gone down very dramatically. Now, all of that could change, but my view is we get through that. And when you get through that, what does that lie beyond? And I think that's going to be very interesting because we've seen a fundamental change now in attitude of not investing, but business. So business is now looking much, much shorter in terms of supply lines. That does not mean we're going to be making iPads or iPhones in Hounslow anytime soon. But it does mean that businesses will be looking for shorter supply lines, more domestic, regional ones. And that means for investing, going to provide us with opportunities. The other issue, of course, in terms of working, particularly office working, now many more people, as we're doing now, using Zoom and other things like that, that actually the impact that has on cities and towns, and particularly commercial property, whoa, that's going to be a big change indeed, and one we haven't factored in. Now, 
add that to possibly remember the primary driver for long-term investing isn't the likes of you and me or silly gits in red braces telling us to buy and sell something. It's the compounding of dividends. Well, they just halved in the past year. And you know, that's really a big impact on longer term investing. So people who are expecting compounding going at 20, 30 years out at a reasonable rate now have to double that period unless those dividends are going to return anytime soon. So this is a, a real change, both for you know, longer term investors and shorter term ones. But for short term ones, it throws up some great opportunities in my view. I mean, I totally agree. I think we've, we've got two things coming out of the virus. We've got sort of like transitory factors. And once, yeah. the, once we get a handle of the actual virus, that will go back. But we've also got transformational factors, as you talk about the stay at, stay at home. So in that, in that yeah. light, are you, you, also, you sound fairly sort of more positively biased about going forward than negatively biased. Is that correct? Or? I'm normally positively biased yes. because the trouble is, yeah, you look in America, America always has a positive bias on the basis things go down, but they're coming back up again. The Brits, for some reason, normally assume the worst. And the net result is quite often we normally get the worst. No, I do see, I'm always a great believer in things we end up muddling our way through. There are some seriously dangerous issues. The Chinese issues, where we've got a Chinese Cold War operating. And of course, the big issue that we're seeing in Europe at the moment is the fatal crack that is inside the EU, or more to point, inside the Euro. You cannot run a single currency if you do not have the disciplines of a single currency, which is free movement of capital, single regula regula regulatory organization, which they're moving towards, uh, but also harmonized fiscal taxation systems, which they haven't got at all. Unless you get those in place, it will fail. Does it fail now or in 10 or 15 years? I don't know. But with the negotiations you've got going on at the moment over the budget, you know, it's going to be yet another big fudge going on. Do you, think, do, you, do you think over the weekend they'll actually reach a sort of crack the nut on the mutualization of debt from sort of club med countries, Italy, Spain and Portugal with the frugal four? Or, or is that going yeah. to be a sort of too, too big a step to take? Do you think they'll actually reach a, a conclusion on that? Yeah, they'll reach a soggy conclusion because they always do in some way or other. Because Mrs. Merkel's running the show. And of course, that's going to be one of the problems. What happens after Merkel? You know, PM, post Merkel, it's going to be really very difficult indeed. And of course, remember the Germans were really desperate that we stayed in. Uh, I remember the, uh, the French, sorry, the German uh, finance minister. Um, and when he was over here, this is a couple of years back, and he said, what happens if we, well, we asked him, what happens if we vote to leave? He said, I'll burst into tears. Not literally, but his point was, he said, don't leave me with the French because this is a French system. I've got to reform it. I want to reform it because it's not working properly, but I can't do that with Denmark yeah. or Sweden or something like that. I need a big power which has got a big budget. So again, EU now has a big problem. It is going to find it very difficult to reform itself uh, without us being in there, but prying, you know, prying normally fairly prudent and practical views on it. Yeah. So I think Europe's going to have significant problems. They will reach an agreement, but the fundamental flaw between the Nero and the Zero, the North and the South, it is still going to be there for some time, unless they're prepared to take real currency action. And the way you do that, by the way, is, is allowing countries to have the domestic currency and an external currency, just as South Africa did many years ago. And also so did Belgium. And that works quite well. Apply that to the likes of Greece. You have the tradable olive or something like that and allow the external debt to stay in euros, which will never get paid back anyway. But we all know that but it allows those economies to start moving. And what and about- The euro won't work. And what about, what about China? Is there any sort of landmarks there that you see? Not landmark, landmines there. <laughs> well, yeah, a lot of landmines there. Um, I mean, politically, it's always been an issue with China. For those that sit there and say, it's a good place to invest. Look, I don't trust Italian reports and accounts on companies. Chinese ones are quite literally unintelligible. And of course, every single company in China public company in China uh, will, of course, ultimately be controlled as to whether it goes bust or not by the Communist Party. I know this sounds like some terrible political doctrine, but that's how it works. Companies don't go bust and that they're allowed to. So otherwise, you've had all sorts of property companies going bust before now. So it is state controlled. And so we're quite right to be suspicious over what's happening. But unlike before, 
Remember, the world's second largest economy is now really important to us. We need it to be participating. And what we need it to be doing is trading. Therefore, the American attitude, or rather the Trump attitude, of anti-trade, more tariffs, is negative. What we have to do is be able to deal with China, trade with China, make sure we sort out the issues over intellectual property and all those elements. And you know, the arguments over dumping and currency manipulation, a lot of that is fairly fatuous because it depends how you want to actually, you know, every currency is controlled to some extent or another. Yeah. What I'm looking for in China is the levels of growth we're now seeing coming back again and the level of trade. Um, now what, how we're going to see this coming through is, are you going to see a pickup in terms of uh, trade coming out of Australia with all the raw materials instead of the blockage you've got at the moment because of this political attitude? So we need to see some thawing in Chinese Cold War. Um, and that's a political issue rather than an eco economic one. And, and putting all that together, where are you putting your money at the moment? As in like your equities, bonds underneath your mattress? Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't trust my mattress. Um, no, what am I, where am I going? And the answer is I'm still back into equities. I was delighted early this year to have the opportunity to invest on a nice little discount. You never get the bottom. Of course you don't. But, you know, I've just been a good opportunity to get some pretty good assets at a cheaper price. UK, or, look at UK some or US? Or Europe? Both. Um, no, certainly, U certainly UK, because UK gives me global exposure. Um, but also US, because you know, I can see the US uh, economy, you can see how that's coming back. Now, again, you've got to be trying quite careful where you're going to. Those retailers, the old-fashioned retailers, you can see what's happened to JC Penney and the others, they're still going to be suffering hugely. The technology-led businesses, the technology companies themselves have already shot off to the moon. But the technology business-led industries, those changing in retail and other areas, they'll be the ones to benefit. And that's what we should be actually looking for there. And also back here. So what do companies look like in a new uh, technology-led uh, world. So retailing changes, it doesn't stop, but it's no longer a high street. It's a different way of doing it. In terms of industry, again, the same thing. Uh, well, how does the technology apply? So that gives me good opportunities uh, in there. Well, which, which certainly, stocks, though, earlier this year. Which stocks specifically, or which stocks specifically, or have you moved into, have you done into ETFs or a bit of both? Well, certainly when, earlier this year, when it, it was too thick to see, I couldn't see through the mist, all I saw was a heavy discount of, is, of indices. Then I was able to use a, a simple uh, ETFs to be able to go in and buy uh, the S&P 500 and uh, a, a good FTSE spread as well. Since then, I'd then be able to be a little bit more specific in going into individual sectors, individual companies, uh, to be able to pick some of those out. And Any so specific names at all you could share? Well, well the, the, in terms of the larger ones, it was actually quite nice to get into actually some of the, uh, you know, the, the, the NASDAQ companies at a, at a reasonable price, still paying a lot for it, but you could still see there was going to be some more growth. Now I'd be backing off on that. Yeah. What I'm now waiting to see is the next generation of companies coming through, because fundamentally there's going to be a change now. Large companies are going to be divesting a lot of assets because they've got debt to pay down. You don't need debt now. They're going to be getting rid of those. Look what those vulture funds are going to be trying to pick up. It's a bit like the stuff that's coming out of Woodford at the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, perfectly good companies, uh, totally illiquid, a lot of them, um, but good quality. And the question is, how, where do they go to next? So I'm spending quite a bit of time now looking at some of the smaller businesses coming out uh, from some of the private equity areas and seeing if there's any opportunity to get into some of that because some good quality nuggets in there. Yeah. Uh, and that's my smaller size. The other area I'm also keen on, and I know it's a very unfashionable moment, is some of the emerging markets. My favourite's always been down in Southeast Asia. Why? It's nothing to do with commodities. Commodities are still going to have a bad time. The rise of the Oriental consumer, known as my daughter, actually, um, but actually the Oriental consumer is astonishing when you look at Indonesia and Malaysia and the Philippines, okay, and you're going to see more of that. Okay. Sorry? Yeah, Indonesia, and Cambodia is another one, I think, isn't it? It's sort of very popular. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then sort of like going forward, what, what sort of data points are you going to be watching to, uh, to, to provide you with sort of a bellwether, a sort of like a, a weather vane of what's going on and, and how, to ch how to change uh, you know, your investment strategy if you need to? Right, the most important one to always, we should always be looking at is the question of confidence, you know, individual confidence. So what am I looking at there? In the US, I'll be looking at the house price confidence, uh, looking at the, the PMIs with the diff in the different areas of manufacturing services and obviously building, they give you some forward view, not necessarily a great deal. 
the level of investment and new investment coming through and also the amount that governments are putting real money into infrastructure. It's not so much they were starting money now, it's a bit like the New Deal with Roosevelt all those years back. It wasn't so much the money he spent immediately because a lot of it was very, very delayed. It provided the confidence for private businesses then to follow in afterwards and say, right, we're going to invest. So I'm looking for investment levels to start picking up. If I've got that, that means confidence is going back into those companies willing to invest and that to me is those triggers. So basically, I'm waiting for the companies to tell me what they're up to. They'll tell you where they're gonna be investing, and where areas, and that could be quite smart money because it's gonna be the brave ones that are gonna be wanting to, uh, to put in more money. There is no shortage of money. I don't mean just the government printing the sodding stuff with more QE, but in terms of private investor money, uh, we've got to tap more of that and get that in to encourage people back in. And Britain particularly needs that, because we're losing, we will be losing out a lot of foreign investment, which we have benefited for the past 15 years. You know, we were one of the, we were one of the leading countries for uh, inward investment after China and after America. It wasn't Germany or France or anyone else. It was the UK. Now we've dropped back again because there's lack of confidence. We've and got to see that, that rebuilt, and that on, to me is a key trigger. And on, so on the confidence, you're going to be looking closely at the sort of Q, Q2 reporting season, both in the US and uh, the UK, because we had last week some quite, uh, should we say, cautious views from some of the US banks. But I didn't, know, I couldn't tell whether they were kitchen sinking or whether they were actually sort of yeah. realistic. What was your view? Well, I think as they were trying to kitchen sink quite a lot of stuff. But what you saw was, you know, the domestic banking side of it was weak. The investment banking side was good. Well, frankly, if you've got running prop desks, and of course they're constricted in what they can do now, obviously. Um, but certainly those with the investment banking side were benefiting and certainly see some recovery. Uh, so that was it. In terms of the ordinary commercial banking side, they're still going to find it very difficult. Why? Because rates are really, really low. Well, we don't state the stunning, the obvious. Banks need a margin. And at the moment, you know, with virtually negative rates, where do, you, where do you get your margin? So domestic banking is going to be a pretty thin skew at the moment, uh, but the investment banking side should be benefiting, but that's always going to be, have that risk on it um, because, well, we saw what happened last time and whether they're going to actually you know, run out of that or not give, allow us to have that confidence. So it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Manager, I thought it was going to be pretty bad. We're going to see Q2. There is a bounce back. It's not a V-shaped recovery. A V-shape is just merely a two-fingered gesture. You're going to see something like a sort of W shape of you know, bouncing up and down coming through. But that's okay, because I still believe, actually, we will be seeing a recovery into a different style of economy. That's fine. But we're not going back to where we were. It's going to be different. And as investors, we need to just keep our radars on to see what's changed and take advantage. So basically, look out for sort of what's actually transition. What are the transformational changes? Just keep a positive bias. Some perhaps some cash on the sidelines and to, to redeploy into opportunities they come through. Yeah, I've been building up more cash over the past few months precisely for that. Um, and you know, the companies will they'll indicate to you. They won't necessarily put out announcements you know, where the next bit of investment is actually going to be going to. Even you know, the, some of the boring retailers, you may look like. So where are they going to focus and how are they going to operate? They're not going to stop because if you are worried then, obviously, in this market, you can then have, what well, you know, almost a, a blue bear portfolio, if you like, which is the bear necessities. Mm. The bear necessities, you know full well, we're still going to be needing power. But power's changed. It's now more green. We're still going to be needing uh, types of, uh, you know, all the facilities that we need in terms of uh, basic uh, utilities that we have in the houses and telephony and all of those elements. That's not going to stop. And what it means is, though, it's going to be affected by technology and by the green issues, which, remember, two years ago was a nice to have, bit of greenwash, satisfy your confidence, that's okay. That's changed. It's now mainstream and, again, something we should be taking note of. And if companies don't have a proper green policy and taking account of it, then they'll be missing out on something. And as investors, we should miss out on them. Well, brilliant, uh, Justin. Many thanks for your time. That's been a fantastic, uh, fascinating 25 minutes and uh, look forward to speaking again in the future. Look forward to it. And best of luck to all your investors. Uh, obey the rules and make some money. 